All right, let's, let's pray and we're going to get started. God, we love you and we thank you for this day. Uh, we ask you, Lord, that you would uh, help us to uh, steward this day as the gift that it is from you. Uh, and on this final stretch of this semester, Lord, I just pray that you would give each person in this room uh, just strength and a little extra grace as they navigate through uh, this week. And uh, Lord, let us make a real difference for you in all that we do. We love you and we thank you for it in your name. Amen. Well, we are closing out our CEU today. I know that makes all of you sad. So sorry for that. Um, but uh, we're going we're gonna to end in Mark 14. And um, it's, there's, there's so much there. Um, and again, last, last time we were together, we talked about Jesus sending his disciples in, right? And, and uh, he said, hey, go, go look for this, uh, this, this donkey that is, that is uh, tied up. And um, it's, a, it's a donkey that's never been ridden. And just take it. And if anyone asks you, just... Um, just tell them that, that uh, the Lord is in need of it. And so that's, that's what they did. They went and basically uh, borrowed the donkey, right? Uh, so it was this pretty incredible step of faith that the disciples took. Again, uh, in, in the latter part of Mark 14, Jesus again gives some similar instructions. Hey, go into town and uh, uh, just, just go up to this guy and tell them, hey, the, uh, the master is in need of your room upstairs. And um, he'll, he'll say, Silicon, come on, take it, and you can, you can have use of this room. And so uh, that's what the disciples did, and that's where, um, that's where the Last Supper took place. We're going to focus in on um, two sets of verses in, in Mark 14. Uh, because I think they tell us a great story uh, that probably we're all familiar with of Simon Peter, but also I, I think when I read this, it's also a great reminder of, of what the Christmas narrative is about in all of our lives. Um, because the Christmas narrative really is for us about what life is like on the other side of failure, right? Uh, because we, we all found ourselves uh, broken and separated from God by sin. For all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Our sins have made a separation between us and God that he cannot hear us, right? Um, and, and yet Christmas is about God sending his son Jesus to sort of repair that breach, to sort of restore, not sort of, but to restore what has been uh, broken by sin to redeem what has been lost by sin. Uh, and so the Christmas story really is about what life is like on the other side of failure. Um, and so we see this modeled for uh, through Simon Peter in, in Mark 14. Jesus, uh, of course, he had already told about the, the betrayal of, of um, Judas. And then, and then, um, um, he goes in. He goes into another. Um, um, he, well, he begins to tell the disciples, "Say, one of you is going to betray me. One of you is going to betray me." And um, Simon Peter, of course, well, this isn't me. And let's just pick up in verse 27. You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, "I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered." Uh, but after he has risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, if I fall away, even if all fall away, I will not. All right? And, and so there's sincerity here, but there's also this arrogance that, 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 that Peter is walking with, right? Uh, even if all these other rascals desert you, you can count on me, Jesus. I will not. What does the Bible say? Let him who stands take heed lest he fall. Um, I think that must have been written about Simon Peter, right? Uh, so even if all else fall away from you, I will not. And, and, and this is what Jesus said. Truly I tell you, 
today, yes, tonight. Like you're saying this right now, Peter, but even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, even if I have to die with you, I will never, ever disown you. And all the others said, said the same. So here we have this, this guy, uh, Simon Peter, who uh, by his faith and his actions was one of the greatest apostles. Um, he was the one Jesus changed his name from, from Simon to Peter, meaning rock. Um, he's the one who, who made that great confession of faith, and Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church, right? He he uh, caught the fish with the money in the mouth. Um, don't you wish God would do that kind of miracle again in, in our lives? Uh, let's go down to the lake and go fishing, right? Um, he's the only one of the disciples that walked on water. Uh, in fact, he's the only person outside of Jesus in recorded human history that walked on water. We can all go try that at the swimming pool. If one of you want to volunteer, we'll watch in video. Um, uh, he, was, he was one of those inner three, uh, in, uh, one of the disciples in that inner circle of three that were, that were most close or that were, that were most close in their relationship with, with Jesus. Um, and yet this night that Jesus was going to be betrayed, he said, Simon, you are going to you are going to deny me three times. You are going to fail me three times. Um, this, is, this is amazing, and I, I don't think Peter is, is buying into it, right? He's like, never me. I, I, I would not do this. I would not, I would not betray you, Jesus. I would, I would not. And yet we know that he did. Um, and the sadness, the sorrow, the disappointment that he must have felt when that rooster crowed and he realized, I just did what Jesus said I would do and what I swore I will never do. Let's face it, we've, we've all been there, right, where, where we make these great, great commitments to the Lord and, and Maybe there's a struggle in our life and we say, man, I'm never, I'm never going to do that again. Never, never going to make that mistake again. Never going to disappoint you in that way again, Lord. And uh, sure enough, at some point in our life, we find ourselves making that same mistake. We find ourselves repeating that, that, same, um, that same thing that we swore we would never do. And this is where, where Peter found himself, himself that, that night. Now, we know um, sort, of, sort of what happened there. Uh, Jesus, um, uh, Jesus did get, get betrayed. He, he, uh, Judas, Judas betrayed him with the kiss that night. He went to, went to jail, stood trial, died on the, on the cross, and um, rose again. What happened to Peter on the other side of this, this, this failure? Well, I think his story is our story, right? And so this, this Christmas season, I just want to challenge you with three or, or four things that happened uh, to Simon Peter after this failure. Number one, there was forgiveness. There was forgiveness. Um, and, and this is our story as well. This is really the story of Christmas. We celebrate the baby in the manger, but the baby in the manger really represents the promise of God uh, of forgiveness in our life. Uh, thank God, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, no doubt, uh, in Peter's life, there was forgiveness after, after his failure. Secondly, there was healing and restoration. There was healing and restoration. Um, I, I think that this is, this is um, 
this is one of the beautiful things about Simon Peter's story is that, that there was this healing that took place in his life after this, but there was also this restoration. And we're going to read some verses in a moment that will help us, help us to see that. But, but this is our story, right? This is the Christmas story in our life. This is why God sent his son to be born in a manger, that we might be restored or we might be redeemed for the original purposes that God has called us to. I think I told the story last year. One of the hardest things for me coming over to Indonesia was, was selling this car that I had, that I had uh, purchased, right? It was my, I love this thing. It was this uh, 1983 uh, Mercedes convertible, amazing car. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. I probably loved it too much. That's why God said move to Indonesia so you have to get rid of it. You, yeah. Anyway, I really love this car, right? And, and so this, this guy in our church, his, his father had, had passed away, and this car had sat in this barn for like uh, 10, 12 years. And, and this car had just been destroyed by rats and, and chipmunks and all these animals, the top of it was just tattered and torn. The inside of it, like when you opened up the hood, there were all these little nests in there where vermins had just uh, made, made their, their place. There was no room in the end, so they went underneath the hood of the, the car to make their, their nest. The tires were just dry rotted. And this guy who had, who had gotten this uh, after his father died said, I don't really want this car. Um, I will sell it to you very cheap, right? And uh, when anyone tells you that about a, a, a car like a Mercedes, just understand that uh, cheap never means cheap. Like cheap was what he was, he was giving me this car for, and I thought, wow, I could, didn't have the money to buy a car, but I can afford this. But if you ever go to like buy a part for a Mercedes, you realize, wait a minute, that one part's more than I paid for the whole car. How could this be, right? Um, and so cheap doesn't necessarily mean cheap, but, but I remember taking this car and I was so proud of it, right? I, I mean, I'd always wanted a classic car and um, I'm like, man, we gotta get this baby ready to drive down the road. And sure enough, I mean, uh, Tyra was like, what is going on here? I've never, never seen this. You're in the garage every night with this car. Um, you know, are you married to this car or to me? What is going on here? You know, but I really did love this car. Um, I remember cleaning out all of the underneath the hood, going and getting new tires on it, getting that new convertible top put on it. And uh, man, just loving, loving this, this car. And I never will forget after I finished everything and realized this thing's ready for the road. And this was an awesome, it's like when you, when you close the door on the car, it's like, it wasn't like these little dinky cars that sound like aluminum can. It was like a, I mean, it felt like a tank. It was awesome. Uh, it was, it was really good. If I had hair, it would be blowing in the wind with the, why are you laughing? Uh, yeah, yeah, so it was great. But, but here's the reality of that, of that car. Like, that car was never made to sit in a barn. That car was never made to be the home of rats and chipmunks' nest. That car was made for the road. That car was made to shine when it was out uh, on, a, on a country road just cruising down the, 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 the road and John Denver playing on the radio. I mean, it, 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 that's what that car was made for. It wasn't made to sit and just rust and decay in an old barn. Our, our lives, like, our lives were ravaged by, by sin. 
like sin did something to us that was so corrosive, like the wages of sin is death, like it eats away at you, it destroys you. But when God created us like man and woman back in the garden, the purpose of him creating was not so they could sit around and corrode from within. It was so that they could live life to the fullest, so they could enjoy God uh, to the fullest and enjoy relationship with God. But sin destroyed destroyed that for us, right? And, and so when Jesus came, what He was doing is He was not only bringing us forgiveness from our sins. The Christmas story is not just about God sending forgiveness to us through His Son who would die on the cross for our sins, but it was also about healing and restoring or redeeming us. Restoring us for the original purposes for which God created us. Because sin had us just sitting up in a garage, destroy, being destroyed and corroded and dying. But God sent His Son that we, might, that we might have life. Siri is listening. It's scary. Right? That we might have life and have it more abundantly. That is so embarrassing. All right. Number, number three, um, uh, there was peace and joy. And I'm going to run through these because I want to get to the last verse um, on the other side of, of failure, there was a peace and a joy that was found. And lastly, on the other side of failure, there was a fulfillment of God's plan uh, for your life and for, for Simon Peter's. I want to just read these verses from John 21. When Jesus died, he, he, he appeared to his disciples three times. Here's one of those encounters. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you, Jesus said, well, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. A third time, and I find it interesting, and I've heard so many people speak to the reasons why Jesus would have asked this three times. I think in my heart as I read through this, I'm like, you know, Simon denied him three times, and Jesus was just giving him the opportunity uh, to sort of walk that back, you know. He didn't just ask him once, but three times uh, he asked him. And just as he denied Jesus three times, now he has an opportunity to confess three times. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Uh, um, and, and Peter was hurt when Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to indicate what kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Here's what we see in this. Um, that even after uh, Peter's failure, right, uh, God comes to him and says, not only are you forgiven, not only are you restored, not only do I want to bring peace and joy back to your life because... Peter was pretty, pretty exuberant and excited when he found out the, that, that the master was alive, right? Uh, that that failure was not final. But, 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 but lastly, to know that the plans that God had for your life were not revoked because of your failure. Uh, this had to be overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly amazing to Peter to realize God still wants to use me. The master still wants to use me. And this, this is one of the big stories of, of Christmas, right? That we have been restored, we have been forgiven, but whatever it is that has happened in your life, we need to know that God's gifts upon your life, that God's calling upon your life is irrevocable, and the manger should remind us of that. God came to restore and God came to revive the callings that have been put upon our life. So I want you to remember this Christmas, God has big plans for you. And there's no mistake, there's nothing that has ever happened to you. There is nowhere or nothing that you have ever done that can keep God's plans from being fulfilled in your life. If you will look, if you will look to the manger and the cross uh, to find that forgiveness, and to find that fulfillment in your life. Let's pray. God, we love you. We thank you so much um, for your goodness. We thank you for uh, the Christmas story. 
We thank you that the Christmas story is not the end of the story, but you not only sent your son to be born in a manger, but to die upon the cross, to be raised from the dead. And as a result of that, we find forgiveness, we find restoration, we find peace and joy, and we find fulfillment. Help us, O Lord, to live that out to the fullest. We love you and thank you for it in your name. Amen. Have a great day, guys.